Hello, everyone. Welcome to the seventh Asia Global Institute Public Policy Webinar. I'm Hei Wai Tang, the Associate Director of the Institute. The AGI Public Policy Webinar Series invites leading scholars and uh, experts from universities and think tanks around the world to present current research on global public policy issues and discuss the implications for Asia and the world. The speaker of our webinar today is Professor Edwin Lai from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Professor Lai has been Professor of Economics at HKUST since July 2009 and was later jointly appointed as a director of the Center for Economic Development and professor in the Division of Public Policy. Prior to joining HKUST, he was senior research economist and advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas in the United States and a faculty member at Vanderbilt University, City University of Hong Kong, and Singapore Management University. He's an expert in international economics, industrial organization, and growth, as well as a leading scholar in the study of intellectual property rights in the global economy. His work has been published in top economics journals, including American Economic Review, Rand Journal of Economics, and Journal of International Economics. The increasing importance of China in the global economy has set the scene for its currency, the renminbi, to assume a key position in the international monetary and financial system. Specific strategies have been used by the Chinese government to internationalize its currency. As the largest offshore RMB market, Hong Kong has been playing an important role to facilitate that process. In the first half of today's webinar, Professor Lai will discuss his forthcoming book published by Cambridge University Press, One Currency, Two Markets, China's Attempt to Internationalize the RMB. He will first discuss the reasons behind China's attempt to internationalize its currency and the specific strategies its government has adopted to achieve that goal. He will then empirically analyze the status of the RMB compared to the US dollar and the Euro. After Professor Lai's presentation, there will be a 30 minutes Q&A session. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box and I will try my best to direct your question to Professor Lai during the Q&A session. Professor Lai, take it away. Thank you, Hei Wai, uh, for a very kind introduction. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. I'm very grateful. So without further ado, uh, let me uh, try to uh, share my screen uh, with you. I hope you all can hear me. Okay, uh, you can see the slide, right? Okay, good, thank you. Uh, so um, this talk is uh, basically, basically based on my book, uh, One Currency, Two Markets, China's Attempt to Internationalize the Renminbi. Uh, the book I heard uh, from the publisher is going to be uh, published uh, on the 8th of July this year. Uh, in UK and Europe, and it will be published in August uh, 2021 uh, in the US. Uh, so in fact, a accepted manuscript of the book is available in my personal homepage for download. Uh, but of course, I also would like you to buy the book uh, if you want. <laughs> okay, so let me just, uh, just uh, begin. Um, Okay, so uh, the Chinese government is trying to international the, internationalize the remedy, but what are the real reasons for doing it? So one reason is that uh, it wants to seek independence from the US dollar, its associated payment system, and the US dollar-based international monetary system for financial and secu national security reasons. I think this reason, uh, many people would, uh, would understand what I mean, so I don't have to uh, uh, further uh, express, but there are also other reasons uh, which I will explain, okay? But I, uh, before I start, I would like to say that uh, currency internationalization generally requires the currency to be largely convertible in the capital account as well as in the current account. 
Uh, however, China does not want to fully integrate its financial system with the West anytime soon, according to my observation. So China adopts this, what I call one currency, two markets approach, which is to have a firewall between the onshore and offshore markets, allowing full comfortability of the renminbi in the offshore market, but partial comfortability in the onshore market. And I predict that this is going to last for a long time. However, uh, renminbi internationalization requires more than the offshore market. It requires capital account opening, financial market development, and other things, which I'll explain. So the, my talk will, uh, will uh, cover the following things. After the introduction, I will ask, why does China want to internationalize renminbi? What is China's strategy of internationalized renminbi? What are the importance of capital account liberalization and financial sector liberalization? What is the importance of offshore RMB market and also the prospects of RMB internationalization? So as a, by way of introduction, I just want to show you uh, the current status of the renminbi. So these are the uh, percentage, uh, percentages of the different currencies. Here's the US dollar, Euro, Japanese yen, and renminbi, okay? Uh, it, regarding foreign exchange market turnover, you can see there's a big difference between renminbi and US dollar. Global payment share also very, you know, 1% uh, versus the US dollar, uh, 45. Foreign exchange reserve share, 61 versus two. So the renminbi is uh, in all these regards, uh, uh, disproportionately small, okay, in the share, whereas the US dollar is disproportionately large, actually. So we're gonna, uh, we, we may, we'll try to uh, understand why. The, the, uh, the Japanese yen and the, and the Euro are somewhere in the middle, as you can see, Euro is the second, uh, second uh, largest currency. Um, the yen uh, currently is the third one, uh, but it may soon be replaced by the British pound and maybe the renminbi. So if you look at the payment share, again, you can see that, uh, as I said, the, uh, the, the GDP share of China is about 15% in 2016, but its payment share is only 1.2%, whereas the US uh, is just the opposite. In 2016, its GDP share is about 25% of the world, but its payment share is 55%. You can see uh, just from these things that, you know, how, uh, disproportionately small uh, the RMB is in its influence in the global international monetary system. Uh, as, as, again, if you look at the international debt securities, it's also a problem. So what's the background? Uh, I just want to tell you that um, one of the reasons why the US dollar has uh, occupied such a dominant position in the international monetary system was because of, of the uh, of the Bretton Woods system. So the Bretton Woods system, uh, after the Bretton Woods system collapsed in 1973, the, con the US dollar continued to be a major uh, reserve currency. And a lot of countries uh, that, uh, pack, that are packed to the US dollar uh, fall into what we call the dollar trap, which is that they have to continue to pack to the US dollar. Uh, there's no other choices. Uh, if they have this, they, if they want to have stable currency, and then they have to accumulate a large quantity of U.S. dollar denominated foreign reserves. And here is a diagram to show you uh, China's uh, foreign reserve. Uh, in uh, in uh, you know this this is this is four trillion U.S. dollar worth. This is three three point five trillion. So at its peak, uh, China actually has uh, something close to four trillion U.S. dollar worth of uh, foreign reserve in the central bank. And it is widely believed that about two thirds of this will be in, denominated in US dollars. So you, you can imagine that there is more than 2 trillion, something like maybe 2.5 trillion uh, US dollar uh, of foreign reserve in, uh, uh, in the Chinese central bank around this time. But it, uh, has, uh, it has declined a little bit, but still large, huge, huge. So RMB internationalization requires an increase in capital mobility. And as a result, according to this, what we call the open economy trilemma, it will actually imply that China's exchange rate 
uh, has to be more uh, volatile. Okay, that is one of the costs to be paid by uh, RMB internationalization. But there's also there are also benefits. Okay, so why does China want to internationalize RMB? First of all, is the monetary sovereignty. Uh, there will be less reliance on foreign currencies such as the U.S. dollar and the associated pay uh, payment system. For example, it can help to uh, avoid the legal reach of uh, and the sanctions of foreign countries such as the U.S. Uh, through its uh, SWIFT system and so on. The second benefit of RMB international in China um, is, according to my observation, to use the capital account liberalization and financial market liberalization that comes with RMB internationalization to force domestic financial sector reform and opening. That's what we call Dao Bi in, uh, in Chinese. Uh, I have found uh, evidence uh, for this kind of motivation uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, my, in my study. That's the second benefit. The third benefit will be uh, if uh, China can borrow and lend internationally in its own currency, it will provide financial security instead of borrowing in US dollar or other, uh, other, other um, uh, hard currency. And also to escape from the, what we call the dollar trap, right? To, to what I just talked about. The benefits to the world, in fact, China, uh, RMB internationalization can also benefit to the world uh, because uh, because it can supply an alternative global safe asset for central bank reserve and an alternative global medium of exchange to fill the gap left by the shrinking importance of the US dollar and the Euro. The US dollar and Euro is uh, set to uh, shrink in that importance because of the shrinking GDP share of the United States and the Eurozone and the rising GDP share of the developing countries uh, of which China uh, is a part. So China's strategy of internationalizing RMB is uh, first of all uh, they uh, begin uh, the RMB trade settlement. They allow and even encourage RMB to be used to settle trade, uh, and in particular China trade, uh, uh, starting from mid 2009. That, that that is an important milestone uh, for RMB internationalization. And this is so a large pool of offshore RMB uh, uh, is uh, uh, formed. Uh, uh, in the offshore RMB market. And this is very soon followed by the formation of the offshore RMB foreign exchange market in Hong Kong. That is the beginning of real uh, RMB internationalization. And then there is this offshore RMB centers, Hong Kong, Singapore, London, uh, that serve a, a lot of functions, settlement, clearing, then bank deposits, stim sum bonds. These are the, the, the offshore bonds. And then uh, the China also engaged in all sorts of capital account and financial market opening measure. Uh, they engage in bilateral currency swap agreement with central banks uh, that will pave the way for the use of uh, renminbi, uh, you know, in uh, to bypass the U.S. dollar in 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 uh, in uh, you know uh, all sorts of uh, things. So here's uh, just a chart to tell you the so-called top 15 offshore RMB economies in terms of payments. So Hong Kong is by far the largest center in terms of payments. So RMB payments uh, in and out of Hong Kong consists of 76% of the world total of uh, uh, RMB payments uh, back in 2018, followed by UK, Singapore. Uh, here is the uh, monthly RMB deposit in Hong Kong in billion US dollar. In, of course, this is our RMB, but it, uh, converted into US dollar terms. And you can see uh, this is the, uh, what you may ask, why is there such a, why is it not, uh, you know, monotonically increasing? Uh, instead, uh, it actually reached a top, a, a peak uh, in around uh, 2015. And then there's a, there's a drastic drop and that is when uh, in, uh, in mid-2015, there was a large uh, setback uh, for the RNB uh, offshore market uh, because, of the, uh, because, because of the change in the, uh, what we call the uh, central parity uh, reform of the renminbi. Of the renminbi. And then of also the, the, there is the, uh, um, uh, a stock market uh, uh, crash at that time. So, so the, the offshore market suffered a serious setback in 2015, 
and it has not it has not recovered actually. I mean, even now, you know, it is a lot more, a lot less uh, RMB deposit in Hong Kong. So, so in other words, RMB internationalization uh, is not a smooth sail. It's not a smooth sail at all. Uh, right now, it's actually um, not. Uh, it's still in a very critical. It's still. It's not. Still not uh, moving very smoothly. So here is the uh, pre settlement. Uh, it reaches again reaches a peak in around 2015, and then and then it now is a, around around 20 percent of China's trade is the norm, is, is is settled in uh, in renminbi. Around 20 percent of China's import plus export are settled in renminbi. That's quite a small number actually, compared with uh, many other other currencies, uh, major currencies. So here's the deposits, which I uh, Hong Kong is still by far the largest, followed by Taiwan and so on. Here is the uh, CNH bond or dim sum bonds issued. Uh, again, it peaked in 2014-15. So now uh, dim sum bond issuance is actually very small uh, compared with the peak time. Uh, so the setback is very clear. So what is the so I want to talk about two uh, two very important aspects, two important uh, factors for uh, uh, for for RMB internationalization. One is the importance of the capital account liberalization, and the other is financial market uh, liberalization or financial market uh, development. So uh, the first of all, we know that China uh, capital account is actually not very open. It's even by developing country standard, China's capital account is quite close. And there has been a lot of capital controls measures and also foreign ownership of domestic bonds is very low. Here is a chart which tells you, uh, which is a, a measure of uh, capital account openness of, uh, of China. And China's openness, it's less than one third those of the United States and Japan. And it's uh, if you look at this solid curve, is China's of capital account openness. It is just better than Indonesia and India. It's below Korea, Thailand, Japan, and the United States. So why is capital account opening important? First of all, you really need your currency to, you know, to, uh, that you really need to people uh, from outside uh, to be able to invest you in your country, you know, then, then they would they would use your currency, right? They would go to the foreign exchange market and exchange into your currency and buy your asset. And and also you also if you open your capital account for domestic citizen to invest uh, 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 overseas, that will also encourage uh, more liquidity of the renminbi, and that's important. So uh, that actually will increase the what we call the market thickness of the currency. If the market thickness increases, means that there is a lot of foreign exchange. Turnover, you know, and and a, a lot of payments being used, uh, a lot of payments are, are being denominated in a renminbi, and, and and that actually would uh, uh, encourage more people to use the renminbi because the transaction cost of of converting into and out of the renminbi becomes smaller. It's increased the convenience of using the currency. So market thickness is a very important uh, reason why you want to have a capital account open. Uh, that's a very, very important factor. Uh, uh, as for financial sector liberalization, again, financial sector reform is important uh, because you really need to have a deep, broad, and liquid financial market to attract foreigners to invest in your in your in your in your country in your assets, and and as they invest more. Uh, in your assets, they again your currency become uh, more actively traded, uh, and and uh, and the market thickness also increases for similar reason, right? It will be more used internationally. It becomes you know uh, easier to buy and sell your currency. Your transaction cost is lower and so on. So it's a similar principle. You um, uh, so so um, you know you 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 want a, a currency. Um, uh, is is an international currency uh, if it satisfies you know uh, this uh, a few roles right one the first role is a unit of account second role is uh, a medium of exchange and third role is a store of value so uh, you know, the renminbi wants to satisfy uh, to to play these three roles they are all interrelated 
So here's the financial market development, uh, financial development index of China. If you look at this, uh, this uh, curve, this is China, it's below that of South Korea and, and that of uh, Thailand, even, even below that of Thailand. So it's low. Uh, so China's financial sector uh, is actually quite lopsided. It is, uh, the banking sector is disproportionately large compared with the bond market and stock market. So it's an underdeveloped financial market. So it cannot be deep, broad, or liquid, uh, which is necessary uh, for the for the for the currency uh, to be to be a uh, to to be uh, to have a, in, enough thickness uh, to become an international currency. So financial repression in China uh, again it doesn't bode well for uh, it's unfavorable to RMB internationalization, interest rate control, dominance of state-owned banks. Control of credit allocation to favor the state owned enterprises. Financial repression lead to capital misallocation. So small firms are disadvantaged. All these actually are, are, are unfavorable to RMB internationalization because when you have an underdeveloped financial system, uh, it is very risky to open your capital account. So you cannot really open your capital account when you have an underdeveloped financial market. Uh, and that actually will be a bottleneck. Uh, for financial, uh, for, for RMB internationalization. So here's just some chart to tell you about the benchmark deposit and lending rate. You know, uh, until 1998, uh, China has uh, asked the big uh, banks to follow strictly these uh, benchmark rates. After 1998, uh, the, they, the banks don't have to strictly follow them, but in fact, they, they have been followed, they have been still following this more or less uh, for a long time uh, after that. I mean, so the uh, so um, the biggest problem with the financial system is the banking sector and the existence of a large number of unprofitable SOE because the, the banking sector will uh, have to uh, direct cheap credit to this, uh, uh, to the to the state-owned enterprises, even even when they are unprofitable, because the state-owned enterprise has to play some non-economic roles. Sometimes the state-owned enterprises have to play social role or even political roles. So the banking system has to actually, uh, uh, you know, channel channel uh, uh, cheap credit to these state-owned enterprises. This is one the biggest problem with the financial system in China. Uh, here, I think I'll skip this. this uh, I don't have time to talk too much about this. Uh, there's a reform starting in 2018 that tend to uh, uh, get further uh, reform the financial system to make it more market oriented. But it's not clear whether it's going to succeed. Uh, here, just to tell you that the, the, the deposit rate liberalization uh, is still far from uh, far from over, I mean, this deposit rate, uh, bank deposit rate is still very much controlled uh, uh, in, in the Chinese banking system, even though the lending rate is a little bit more liberalized. The bond market, it's uh, too small, uh, especially the central bank bond market, it's, uh, it's um, not well developed, uh, it's uh, foreign ownership. Foreign ownership of the central bank bonds are still too small, uh, for for uh, the renminbi to, to be a truly global currency because central bank bond market central bank uh central government i'm sorry central government bond market is is uh is uh, uh crucial in making the currency a uh a reserve currency uh or, or even a major uh store of value uh, currency uh because it's the safe it's a safe asset right so the central government bond uh is a safe uh, asset uh, for uh, for reserve and for corporate uh, corporate uh, treasury management. Uh, so bond market is small. You can see as a percentage GDP compared with U.S. Japan. Uh, foreign ownership of domestic central government bonds small compared with uh, Japan, U.K., U.S. Turnover that means uh, the uh, liquidity. Turnover is liquidity. You see that the, the China's central government bond turnover ratio is close to zero. It's here, it's here, oh, uh, and, and much, much lower than the others. 
So uh, it's not a liquid, it's not a very liquid uh, 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 bond market. Uh, stock market, track record, not very good. Lots of government intervention, lack of transparency, capital controls, corporate governance issues. So as a result, the banking, so the financial system by and large consists of the banking sector, bond market and stock market. But the bond market and stock market are underdeveloped. So the, the system has to rely overwhelmingly on the banking sector. But the banking system, as I just said, uh, is not market oriented because of a lot of the, the banks has to channel cheap credit to the state owned enterprises. So that's a problem. Uh, stock market, again, are uh, you know, uh, small uh, uh, by, uh, uh, in, in terms of GDP. Uh, so um, if you look at the offshore market, um, you know, uh, as I said, when, so now, now we come to the point of uh, talk about the one currency, two markets, okay? So one currency, two markets. So the, that's the offshore market where the renminbi, offshore renminbi is called the CNH, which is fully convertible, while the onshore renminbi is called the CNY, it is not fully convertible. So there's a firewall between the two. So internationalizing the currency while opening the onshore capital account at China's own pace. And that is the motivation. The motivation of engaging in one currency, two markets is that China's, China is still unwilling to open its capital account anytime soon. Uh, it wants to open the capital account at its own pace. Uh, and so it ha have this uh, open the offshore market, but not the onshore one. But the offshore market cannot be a main driver of RMB internationalization. The main driver are still financial development and capital account openness, as, as I just said. So there's more intervention in the onshore market, onshore foreign exchange market. There's uh, very little or less intervention in the, in the offshore market. So you have this connect uh, schemes uh, in Hong Kong, where the Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect, Shen, uh, sorry, Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect, Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect, and then the Bono Connect. These schemes are the latest, uh, the latest initiatives uh, to open the capital account of China uh, through Hong Kong, through Hong Kong. So Hong Kong plays a very important role. Okay, so Hong Kong actually uh, as a, as, as an offshore RMB market. Uh, plays a very important role uh, in opening the capital account of China uh, and de develop the financial market of China uh, and for R&D internationalization. So there is the uh, cross-border in the bank payment system is uh, actually a very important uh, uh, element of uh, R&D internationalization uh, in terms of what we call monetary sovereignty, which I mentioned earlier, uh, which is uh, now uh, with the CIPS, uh, uh, functioning, uh, it can potentially enable Chinese international payment flows to avoid legal reach of foreign countries, such as the US, uh, to avoid uh, being easily sanctioned uh, by, by foreign entities. So finally, I want to talk about the prospects of internationalization of uh, RMB. Uh, uh, there are four key factors, economic size, capital mobility, uh, financial development, and Foreigners' confidence on the Chinese system, which I have not talked about uh, until now. Uh, sorry. Uh, so China has the economic size, but it has to work on the other three factors. So my econometric te model tells me that by 2030, the renminbi can become a distant third payment currency behind US dollar and euro, distant third. If China increases its financial development and capital account openness fast enough, but it's only if it do it fast enough. Economic size alone will not catapult the RMB into the league of major payment currencies. It is hard for China RMB to become a safe haven currency because it requires the trust of foreign countries on the Chinese system. Okay, so uh, in the long run, the world may become a multi-reserve currency system with the US dollar, euro, and possibly the renminbi being the three main reserve currency in the long run but I don't know how long is that long run. The road for the RMB to get there may be quite long and uncertain. However, if the RMB internationalization can successfully be domestic financial development and open, the initiative should still be considered a success. That's my judgment. So if we, in other words, 
uh, if RMB internationalization can be used to force domestic financial reform, we can still consider RMB internationalization to be a success. It's a little bit ironic, but that's my, that's my conclusion. Uh, okay, so that's the end, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Lai, for the amazing, effective, and informative uh, talk. Um, I didn't mean to <laughs> force you to finish at 5.30, but you did manage no. to go through uh, so many slides uh, on time. Sure. Uh, there are already some questions uh, in the Q&A box, uh, but I would like uh, to ask the first couple of questions. Um, the first one is uh, really about the pace of financial reforms that you mentioned uh, towards the end of your presentation. Yeah. Uh, we know uh, in the last few years, um, you know, the Chinese uh, government and its central bank have been um, implementing more uh, reforms and liberalization in the financial system. For example, uh, in the summer last year, uh, foreign financial institutions uh, were allowed uh, to increase their ownership uh, in China to uh, 100%, meaning uh, mm -hmm. Now uh, we can see uh, wholly owned uh, foreign firms uh, in the financial sector. Uh, and as, at, at the same time, uh, we know, uh, you know, the central bank has been talking about uh, digital RMB. Uh, so when you uh, commented on uh, the pace of financial reforms, uh, do you think, you know, those developments uh, are in the right directions in potentially facilitating a faster uh, speed of RMB interna internationalization, or do you have something else in mind that you think the Chinese government has to work on first? Uh, uh, besides, you know, those two, uh, I would say, hallmark uh, development uh, in the recent time in China. Well, as I said, uh, well, I, I, I take note of the fact that China, uh, China's opening uh, has not slowed down in recent years. In fact, if anything, it, you might even say that they have, they have speeded up in the, in the last uh, a few years, uh, as you mentioned, uh, allowing uh, wholly owned uh, uh, firm, foreign firms, uh, financial uh, financial firms uh, in China, and, and but I think the key is still the uh, interest rate reform, for example, uh, which is banking sector reform, basically, right? So. China has to still uh, relax its, uh, you know, uh, the interest rate has to be market determined, and it's still not. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the reason why it's not is because number one, the deposit rate is still uh, very much controlled, uh, you know, deposit rate. Secondly, the lending rate even, uh, it's uh, is still in the process of reforming. It's still not totally market determined. It's uh, the central. Uh, bank governor Yi Gang uh, has done something uh, uh, to reform, and now they are uh, using uh, uh, what we call the market determined uh, loan prime rate system uh, to uh, to uh, somehow uh, relax the uh, the uh, the interest rate uh, to make the interest rate more market determined. Uh, but still, it is not over. I mean, the the mark uh, the, the interest rate reform is still uh, work in progress. I think that's very important. Uh, for, 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 for China, uh, that, that's a very important element uh, for the uh, financial sector reform. Uh, digital central bank digital currency, uh, I, would I would say that is not really uh, what we call financial sector reform. <laughs> it is just uh, some FinTech, uh, some financial technology uh, stuff. It's, it's not really financial sector reform. Uh, and I also want to say that the bond market has to be further developed, especially the central government bond, what we call the Chinese uh, government bond market, has to be further developed and increase the foreign ownership. Foreign ownership of the central government bond is very important for uh, internationalization of a currency. You just look at the U.S. Treasury bond. The U.S. Treasury bond market is, is a huge, is the most liquid uh, asset in the world. And that helped to maintain the U.S. dollar as the, as the dominant uh, global currency. Uh, stock market also, uh, I have already said that, but it needs a lot of uh, reform, uh, credibility and, and capital control. If you, if you capital control, you have to relax the capital control. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, 
not going to work. Great. Um, let me uh, ask a question about confidence uh, in uh, the Chinese currency. Um, and there have been quite a few questions sort of related to uh, that uh, issue. Uh, and we know central bank independence is a key fundamental uh, for investors mm. to trust uh, not only the mm. currency itself, but also mm. the monetary policy that will affect the value of the currency. Uh, so in your opinion, without more central bank independence, what kind of strategies can the Chinese authorities adopt in order to increase foreigners' confidence in the RMB? Actually, uh, I happen to think that central bank independence is not crucial uh, in the case of China. Uh, China is not a democratic country, uh, which actually may uh, make it uh, less important for the central bank to be independent. Uh, the reason why uh, Western democratic countries require the central bank to be independent is that they worry that the politicians may manipulate the central bank in their favor to uh, affect the election outcome in the next election uh, or to gain some political capital. But because China is not a democratic country, so the government doesn't need to manipulate the central bank to, uh, to allow the <laughs> The, gov the government to be re-elected. Uh, and so actually the, the central bank in China uh, uh, without its independence may actually have a lot of credibility. Uh, in fact, I would argue that uh, China's central bank has a lot of uh, credibility. Uh, it can, uh, it, it, it's professional, it's professional and it plays a role in cooperating with the, uh, with the other branches of the go government to uh, to actually uh, play a more important role in the reform of China. So I, I in that sense, I actually uh, um, I take a more contrarian view of the central bank uh, independence. Good, but how about uh, foreigners' confidence in the RMB? You know, what would be the necessary strategies, in your opinion, that the Chinese government can consider? Uh, necessary strategy for a foreigner to have more, more uh, confidence in the renminbi, right? Right. Uh, well, first of all, I would say again that the central bank independence is not crucial for the people to have confidence in the RMB because the uh, People's Bank of China uh, has a very good record, actually. If you look at the record of the People's Bank of China, it has a very good record. Secondly, I think to, to have the confidence in renminbi uh, is... Uh, Inflation rate, okay. Uh, China has to maintain inflation rate, and in which China actually has already done, okay. Inflation rate has been maintained at a very uh, low uh, level, um, and uh, uh, and, uh, and and what else? The exchange rate, exchange rate, um, exchange rate. I uh, also it, it's uh, uh, has. Uh, Exchange rate has to be stable, but not controlled, uh, not, not excessively controlled. Uh, I think that will uh, make people confident. Uh, and I think in that regard, uh, the, Chinese, uh, the, the Chinese actually have done, also done a good job, actually. Um, so uh, um, I would say, um, the, the biggest obstacle is some uh, something more fundamental, which is the, uh, for example, the legal system, or um, or is uh, you know, uh, contra enforcement, um, you know, rule of law, uh, judiciary independence. Uh, this kind of thing is very very some fundamental, uh, and uh, it will affect people's confidence on. Uh, the government, whether the government uh, would do uh, something to expropriate uh, properties, asset, or, or suddenly impose capital control, that kind of thing. I think that those things are had to be worked on for China. Good. Um, so I have one last question for myself, but you know, I think some of the uh, participants also had a similar interest. And that is, uh, on the one hand, you said you know Hong Kong has been playing 
a very important role in helping China to internationalize its currency. But I also saw in one of your slides saying that you know, offshore RMB market cannot be the main driver for the RMB international, internationalization. Could you speak a little bit about you know, the current role of Hong Kong and the future role of Hong Kong uh, in helping uh, China to continue its uh, efforts to internationalize its RMB? Yes, uh, I think uh, Hong Kong can play a role in uh, helping uh, China to open its capital account and uh, helping uh, China to further develop its financial system. So, uh, as I said, the key, one of the two keys in RMB internationalization is the capital account opening and financial development. And Hong Kong can help China to further develop along these two dimensions. And China and Hong Kong's offshore market can also help to amplify the effects of these two things on RMB internationalization. So, so uh, amplify meaning that, uh, you know, because Hong Kong is a well-developed financial center, it can help to, um, to link with the rest of the world. It can uh, help to uh, China to develop an offshore RMB financial market. And this offshore uh, uh, RMB financial market can in turn uh, help to, uh, to, to, uh, to further open the capital account uh, of China and, and, and uh, uh, develop the financial sector of China. Um, uh, the, um, and um, so, so uh, you, you also talk about, uh, oh yeah. So the offshore, the offshore uh, RMB market uh, is actually uh, uh, quite important uh, for RMB internationalization. The offshore uh, RMB market is actually quite important for RMB internationalization because people outside of China would want to hold, you want people outside of China to hold RMB, right? And that they, they, you, you need uh, an offshore uh, RMB financial market for, for this to happen, okay? So China can play this role. I mean, Ch Hong Kong can play this role. So currently you ask me what is the current and the, for, and the future role played by Hong Kong. The current role in Hong Kong is to be a, um, is a, to be a, a place uh, that uh, helps China's capital account opening. For example, we have this Connect schemes. We have this Stock Connect, Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect, Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect, and the Bond Connect. These schemes are all through Hong Kong. These are capital account opening measures through Hong Kong, which is a well-established financial center. So, so this is the, the current role. Future role, I would say, um, well, continue uh, doing this. Um, and um, I, I suppose um, that the future role of Hong Kong really uh, have to depend on the onshore. Okay, so, so I think, um, Hong Kong, okay, so Hong Kong would have to be a distinct entity from mainland. So this one currency, two markets is dependent on one country, two systems. Okay, they are actually interlinked. Uh, so Hong Kong had to continue to uh, play this uh, a separate uh, entity from the rest of mainland in order to play its future role. And I, I predict that it's going to continue to play an important role because I see that uh, for a long time, uh, China would not want to uh, open its capital account anytime soon. So Hong Kong will have continue to play this very important role uh, to be a window of China. Good. Um let me ask uh, one of the participants questions. Could you please talk more about CIPS, cross-border uh, payment system? Right. Can it really offer an alternative to SWIFT? Okay. The CIPS is a running B payment system and it just launched, uh, the second phase is just launched in 2018. It is used for uh, RMB payment. Uh, and I, 
you know, there, there are bank, you know, all the major banks are members of the CIPS. Uh, all the major banks in the world are members of the CIPS. So, so banks from overseas can actually directly send RMB uh, from their own country to China through the CIPS. Or uh, banks in China can also send their currency uh, to uh, foreign countries through the CIPS. In the past, there is uh, the so-called clearing bank system uh, because there was no CIPS. But the CIPS will gradually uh, replace the clearing banks. The, the clearing banks eventually will diminish and maybe even disappear from the scene. Um, and gradually, uh, the, well, the SWIFT uh, is actually just a messaging system. SWIFT is not a payment system. SWIFT is just a uh, messaging system. And CIPS is SWIFT compatible, but it's actually not using SWIFT as a messaging. Uh, the, uh, or uh, I, I think it is not, or, or maybe it is not going to. I, that is one thing I, I'm not uh, positively sure is whether CIPS is actually completely not using SWIFT, but, but it will not in the, I think that the idea is that CIPS will not use SWIFT messaging. It will be completely independent from, uh, from that. Will be uh, China under Chinese jurisdiction. Um, so the SWIFT, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the CIPS will be like chips in the US. I mean, that's the, the best way to think about CIPS is chips in the US. So it's the equivalent of, it's the Chinese equivalent of chips. If you understand what is chips. Chips is the US payment system. It's called the clearinghouse in the bank. Uh, what is that? Uh, CHI, uh, CHIPS, right? Uh, clearinghouse in the bank payment system. That is the US system. Uh, it's for international payment of US dollar. Great. Um, there are a couple of questions about uh, the digital RMB. Um, right. It is hard not to think that the central bank in China is so eager uh, to launch the digital RMB, partly related to its uh, internationalization um, uh, goal. Uh, could you comment a little bit about that? Right? Do you think um, you know digitization of RMB by reducing the transaction costs? Uh, for the users uh, will help uh, the RMB to be more popular and commonly used? In my opinion, the uh, central bank digital currency of China uh, would not really help RMB internationalization very much. Uh, uh, it, it, um, the, the reason is, as I said, I mean, uh, uh, RMB, it, if you want RMB to be an international currency, if you, RMB, you want RMB to be used by foreigners, how, why would foreigners want to use RMB? Okay, why, they, what do, why would they want to keep RMB? It must be that they, you know, uh, that they, they keep the RMB but because it's, it's very widely used. It is easy to exchange back into their own currency. It's easy to, to exchange, right? And, and, um, and it's, easy to get in and out of the currency uh, in large quantity uh, without affecting uh, the exchange rate, uh, uh, without affecting the, 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 uh, the, the interest rate of the asset. So, so um, all these are related to financial development of the country or capital account openers or the size of the country. So just imagine, I mean, it, it, Will digital currency will, will the uh, with the introduction of uh, central bank digital currency in China really increase the foreign exchange turnover of the renminbi? Um, I I just uh, don't think it is going to be a very important uh, element. It will I think on the margin it can affect. Uh, Maybe it can uh, encourage uh, some uh, developing countries to use the RMB. Uh, why? Because there are some countries, uh, developing countries, where people actually had a problem accessing a bank 
for, for people who have problem accessing banks, digital currency is actually useful. Some people in some developing countries, they, they don't even have bank accounts. If they don't have bank accounts, then the digital currencies are actually very useful. And in that case, they may actually adopt the, let's say, you know, uh, maybe they adopt their own central bank digital currency, not necessarily using the renminbi's digital, digital currency. So I, I just cannot think of uh, any reason why the digitization can uh, largely help the uh, uh, RMB internationalization. Great. And then the question uh, from the audience um, is hard to rationalize, you know, how on the one hand, the Chinese government wanted to open up their more, the capital accounts, uh, so that the RMB can be more internationalized. But on the other hand, the costs are obvious, right? You know, higher financial instability, uh, as well as it may be incompatible with the central government's uh, increased uh, planning and control of its economy. Uh, right. Could you comment on this, right? I mean, it seems that, you know, things are contradictory. Mm. Right. Uh, well, you, you want to, they want uh, RMB to have more influence internationally. Uh, you, they want people to be willing to accept RMB as a medium of exchange, right? If you want to borrow, you want to borrow in RMB increasingly. You don't want to borrow in the US dollar or, or Euro. I mean, Chinese citizen borrowing in, in US dollar internationally is risky. Because you uh, you just imagine if, if somehow there's a speculative attack, suppose the RMB be drastically de depreciate, it actually is risky uh, if you're borrowing in US dollar. It is, it is best to borrow in your own currency. So you, but in, in order to be able to borrow in your own currency, you, you really need uh, people to be willing to to uh, uh, to hold, you know, uh, to, to hold on to RMB, right? Uh, RMB becomes a you know widely used currency. Otherwise, it just doesn't doesn't work, right? So, um, well, you may say, is it is internationalization in in this way worth it? Is it worth it to to open the capital account? Uh, well, opening. Uh, I mean, I mean, you, you, you may even ask the same question about one bell, one row, right? I mean, row, belt, and row. I mean, why, why would China want to do what belt and row? I mean, the, so, so uh, China. I mean, China wants to have more international influence, that more political influence internationally. You, you want to have the political influence. I mean, let be internationalization is one way to achieve political influence, actually, because if other people use your currency more. Uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a reserve currency, for example. If they're shortage of RMB, you can provide them with RMB liquidity. That is actually political influence. You know, you want that. I mean, for example, you want, in particular, just think about the Southeast Asian countries. Would China want to have more influence in Southeast Asia? You bet, they do. And one of the things is to, add to make them use RMB for trading with China. To use RMB, you know, for, you know, as a, medium of exchange and, 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 and store value and even reserve currency. So then you have more political influence, right? So, uh, but if you just close your capital account, you, you just can't achieve that, okay? Another thing is the capital account, I already mentioned that, well, maybe uh, people didn't pay attention to think that that is important. It's the Dao B. You, some people actually want to use the RMB internationalization to actually force domestic financial reform. These are the more liberal elements in China, the more liberal elements. They want, they actually want to use that as a tool to force domestic reform, finance, financial reform. And China badly needs domestic financial reform because the financial sector is still underdeveloped. It's still underdeveloped, greatly underdeveloped. There's, there's still financial repression. Uh, that there is, there is still, uh, uh, you know, uh, not, you know, not market de uh, determined uh, 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 financial market. 
uh, is very, there's a capital misallocation as a result of that, a, a very serious capital misallocation. That may be the next, next financial sector reform may be the next bottleneck of China's reform. So you need financial reform, but there's a lot of vested interest that resist financial reform, in particular, the banking sector people, the state-owned enterprises, and those people, they actually resist financial reform. How can you, how can you force them? How can you force their hand? You may use RMB internationalization as a tool, okay? And, 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 and RMB internationalization, it, it's actually a good, really, a good excuse, <laughs> if you will, it's a good excuse because it's a it's a matter of national pride. It's 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 to increase the uh, international influence of China. It's a good excuse, right? So that that is my uh, my view about uh, 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 about this. So if you're talking about the cause of of that, the cause of uh, uh, capital account opening, yes, there are costs actually. So that's why I I think China would not open its capital account too much. That's, that's, that's why. That's why it relies on Hong Kong. That's why Hong Kong is important. Yeah. Good. I mean, that actually reminded me of why China wanted to join the WTO in 2001, right? You know, part of the reason is because they wanted to get external pressure exactly. through the accession of WTO to pressure, to increase the pressure on domestic reforms. Exactly, exactly. I mean, if you, if you listen to people like uh, Zhou Xiaochuan, uh, his his view. He 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 kept talking about opening, opening. He just kept saying opening. China must open, otherwise it's, there's no 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 way out. I mean, China must open. Okay, how do you, you know what do you mean by open? He was very vague about that. But but you know, one of the opening is to let the RMB let, let the capital come opening. It's it's one of them. Yeah. Great. Let me ask the last question. Since you mentioned uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, I also want to add to that, you know, RCEP, uh, the recently signed uh, regional trade agreement. Uh, how would those new regional uh, development uh, uh, help uh, the increased demand uh, for uh, RMB uh, and therefore uh, RMB internationalization? Okay. Again, I, my view uh, is that Belt and Road Initiative would not really help RMB internationalization very much. <laughs> Uh, uh, despite the, some people have a different view, uh, I, I don't think a Belt and Road Initiative is going to help RMB internationalization very much. In fact, in my book, I have some very simple calculation to project the effect, potential effect of RMB, of a Belt and Road Initiative on RMB internationalization. Uh, my estimate is that the impact is very, very small. Uh, it, it, uh, the reason is uh, because, again, going back to the fundamentals, which is, I said, the RMB internationalization requires financial sector reform, capital account opening, uh, GDP share, and international trust of your currency, in particular, the trust of the wealthy countries. Now, these things will not be basically fundamentally affected by Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but on the margin, it can. For example, you, a Belt and Road Initiative uh, will, uh, for example, increase uh, uh, China trade uh, and foreign, uh, foreign direct investment relationship with these uh, Belt and Road countries. And there will be more uh, Chinese, uh, uh, more, more uh, because there's more China trade, then therefore they will use RMB as the, as the trade settlement currency, more, okay? That, that is what that is the, the, the effect. And then the second effect is that a lot of people say that it will increase government uh, issuance of international debt securities, uh, RMB denominated bonds to finance uh, uh, bonds and loans, for example, to finance this, uh, infrastructure projects. That is also a uh, thing, uh, thing. But the thing is, when this, when, when you to finance this Baron Road initiative, you don't necessarily use RMB denominated as uh, bonds or, or loans. I mean, you can also use uh, US dollar denominated or other dollar. So whether or not RMB bonds are being used or RMB loans are being used will also depend on the fundamentals. Uh, you know, uh, so, so, so it's just not clear, you know, uh, uh, you know it, it will, on the margin it will, I, I'm sure, uh, because, because 
a lot of these infrastructure projects actually re requires Chinese participation, uh, requires a uh, trade with China, with, with, with requires Chinese uh, uh, firm participation or Chinese foreign investment or Chinese uh, exports to these countries or Chinese import from these countries. In that sense, they can encourage, they would push for the use of RMB uh, for, for, for these purposes. But, uh, but these are not fundamental things. They, they, they just, just increase it, uh, you know, it, just on the margin. Yeah. Very good. Um, I am sure uh, we would like to talk to you for another half an hour, <laughs> but unfortunately it's already over 6 p.m. here in Hong Kong. Uh, and we have to uh, stop uh, this uh, very interesting and insightful discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Lai. Uh, we all look forward to uh, buying your book uh, and I already see some comments in the Q&A box saying that they will buy a copy. Uh, so okay. this event definitely help you uh, to sell a few more copies. Uh, and um, I would like to ask the IT team uh, to bring out the information about your book as well as um, uh, some marketing stuff about a AGI. Uh, first of all, uh, follow us on different uh, social media platforms. Uh, we are on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, and later on, we're going to post today's uh, event, uh, uh, recorded event on YouTube. Uh, and uh, for those of you who uh, uh, have a lot of questions that are uh, not answered uh, because of the time constraint, and I'm sure you will find the answers in uh, Professor Lai's book, One Currency, Two Markets. Uh, and it should be uh, available for sale uh, by the end of August. You know, I just checked on Amazon and they can deliver on August 31st. Okay, get a copy right now uh, and it will be delivered to your house uh, by the end of the summer. Thank you so much, Professor Lai. Uh, good evening uh, and uh, hope to have you again uh, in the near future. Thank you, my pleasure.